Halloween 1963 in Indianapolis and hundreds of spectators are gathered at the Indiana, Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum for the Holiday on Ice Skating Exhibition. Today is October 31st, 2023, and I would like to bring you this day in history. Then, just after 11 p.m., a propane gas explosion from the concession area rips through the Coliseum and shoots a 40-foot orange flame through the south side seats. The explosion killed 54 people on site and at least 20 more died, later died from their injuries. Nearly 400 additional people were injured in the horrific explosion, which started from a leaking rusty propane tank in the concession area. The gas met an electric popcorn machine during the skating finale, which ignited the explosion that sent concrete chunks, chairs, and people into the air. Some spectators landed on the ice floor while others were buried beneath giant slabs of concrete. You walked into a nightmare, reporter Richard R. Roberts in the Indianapolis Star. It was worst thing I've seen since the combat in World War II. Roberts described graphically details like a red satin slipper on the ice just three feet from a pool of blood. The fairgrounds itself was almost like a battleground. The surrounding, the surrounding streets thick with police and the edge of streets jammed with crowds like war refugees, slowing the movement of ambulances and fire engines, he reported. The Coliseum explosion was considered by many to be the largest single disaster in Indiana history. Indianapolis news reporter Bill Roberts was attending the event with his wife and he described the horrific moments after the explosion. A few seconds, no one cried out, Roberts reported. Then there were screams and cries of agony and the audience jumped from their seats as if in unison and started rushing for the exits. My wife was drawn to a small blonde girl with her mother. The child's blue coat was soaked in blood. They were looking for the father. Hundreds of rescuers, including police, firefighters, and the Red Cross and the Salvation Army volunteers flooded the Coliseum to find survivors. They used bus, buses, ambulances, and private cars to transport, transport victims to Indianapolis area hospitals. They established a temporary hospital in the cattle barn at the fairgrounds, and the coroner's office set up a temporary morgue on the ice floor where bodies were covered and lined up. The years of Years of litigation followed the explosion, with more than 400 lawsuits for amounts totaling $70 million against various insurance companies and the state of Indiana. A grand jury also indicted several people on criminal charges, including the state fire marshal, the Indiana fire chief, the general manager and concession manager, of the Indianapolis Coliseum Corporation and several officers from the gas supplier. There was only one conviction, Edward J. Farner, president of Discount Gas Corporations for assault and battery. Although the Indiana Supreme Court later reversed the conviction, all charges against the others were dropped. As for the call, Coliseum. It was repaired in 1991 and got a scholarship and renamed the Pepsi Coliseum. When that expired, the venue became the Indiana Farmers Coliseum. 
the venue underwent a $63 million renovation that was complete in 2014. Since the mid-90s, the venue has hosted a safe night Halloween event for kids and parents every October 31st. Now I would like to bring you another This Day in History. In the autumn of 1964, Beatlemania was the raging epidemic in Britain and it was rapidly spreading across the European continent. But in the United States, where the likes of Bobby Vinton and Jimmy Glimmer and the Fireballs set atop the pop charts, John, Paul, George, and Ringo could have walked through Grand Central Terminal completely unnoticed. It wasn't Grand Central that the Beatles were trying to walk through on October 31st, 1963. However, it was Heathrow Airport, London, where they just returned from a hugely successful tour of Sweden. Also at Heathrow that particular day, was a talent scouting tour of Europe was the American television impressionado Ed Sullivan. The pandemonium that Sullivan witnessed as he attempted to catch his flight to New York to New York would play a pivotal role in making the British invasion possible. It wasn't for lack of trying that the Beatles were still unknown in the United States. Their manager, Brian Epstein, had tried and failed repeatedly to convince Capitol Records, the American arm of their British label, EMI, to release the single that had already taken Europe by storm. Convinced that the Mercy Beat sound wouldn't translate across the Atlantic, Capitol Records declined to re release Please Please Be from Me to You and She Loves You, allowing all three to be released on minor American labels VJ and Swan and to languish on the pop charts without any promotion. Desperate to crack the American market, John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote a song explicitly tailored to the American market and recorded it just two weeks before their great, fateful, indirect encounter with Ed Sullivan. That song was, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Ed Sullivan had his staff make inquiries about the Beatles following his return to the United States and Brian Epstein arranged to travel to New York to open negotiations and in what surely must rank one as one of the greatest one two punches in history of professional talent management Epstein convinced the Ed Sullivan show to have the Beatles as headliners for three appearances rather as a one-time mid-show novelty act and he then leveraged that contract into agreement by Capitol Records to release I Want to Hold Your Hand in the United States and back it with a $40,000 promotional campaign. As a result of the chance encounter at Heathrow on this day in 1963 and of Brian Epstein's subsequent coup in New York, the Beatles would arrive in the United States on February 7, 1964 with a number one record already to their credit. The historic Ed Sullivan appearance that followed would lead to five more in the next 12 months. Now I'd like to bring you another This Day in History. Indira Gandhi 
the Prime Minister of India is assassinated in New Delhi by two of her own bodyguards, Bint Shi and Swarna Shai, both Sikhs, emptied their guns into Gandhi as she walked into her office from an adjoining bungalow. Although the two assailants immediately surrendered, they were both shot in a subsequent scuffle and Bent died. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, attempted to forge an unified nation out of many religious, ethnic, and culture fractions that existed under British rule until 1949. His daughter Indira Gandhi, no relation to Mahas Gandhi, rose to power in 1966, fighting many of the same problems as her father had. Her own political re career was a roller coaster from heights following India's victory over Pakistan in 1971 to the lows of being thrown out of office in 1977 after declaring a state of emergency in 1975, during which time she suspended civil liberties and jailed her political opponents. Although many criticize her for being authoritarian, the majority of the population supported her because of her extensive social programs. In 1980, Gandhi began prime, became prime minister again, enjoying fairly widespread popularity. However, however, in June 1984, she ordered an army raid on a Sikh temple in Punjab to flood out the Sikh extremists setting off a series of death threats. Due to the fear of assassination, Bent Singh, her longtime bodyguard, was to be transferred because he was a Sikh. However, Gandhi personally rescinded the transfer order because she trusted him after many years of service. Obviously, this was a fatal mistake for both of them. Satwan Singh, who survived to stand trial, was convicted in 1986 and was executed in 1989. Following Gandhi's assassination, riots broke out in New Delhi. More than a thousand innocent Sikhs were killed. Indiscriminate attacks over the course of two days. Gandhi's son Rajiv succeeded her as Prime Minister. I want to thank you for watching today and as always stay safe and stay blessed and remember to smile because I love you but more importantly our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loves you and that's the best love that you could have. If you like the content of this video, please give it a and comment down below. Those two things really help my channel, but what really helps me out is if you subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Come on over and subscribe and be a part of our little serendipity subbing. All right, everybody, have a blessed day, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye, everybody.